Hello and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for NCSL's webinar, Helping Students Access School Mental Health Services. My name is Tammy Jo Hill, Policy Specialist with the NCSL Health Team, and I'll be your moderator for today. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to review a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is a platform for information exchange and engagement. Over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box, so feel free to type your questions and answer any questions in the chat screen, in the chat box on your screen. To begin building some comfortability with the chat function and to also learn who is on the line today, I invite you to type the state in which you're calling from now. We will hold a formal Q&A after our present presenters are finished presenting today. I also want to briefly mention resources. Above the presentation, you will see a couple tabs with one of them labeled resources. Here you will find and download a PDF version of the PowerPoint, as well as some other handouts. Another tab is labeled speaker, where you will be able to read the bios of today's speakers. You can access these tabs at any time during the presentation. The webinar platform we are using is optimized for use in Google Chrome. While other web browsers such as Firefox may work, we recommend anyone experiencing technical difficulties try signing in through Chrome instead. If you continu continue to experience technical difficulties, please email registration at ncsl.org where our team is ready to assist you. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCSL's website within the week. For those of you who are new to NCSL, we are a bipartisanship member, member organization representing all 50 states, 7,383 legislators, and over 30,000 legislative staff. Our mission is to improve quality and effectiveness among state legislatures, promote policy innovation and communication among state legislators, and ensure a strong cohesive voice in the federal system. I would like to say thank you to the Bainham Family Foundation for their partnership and support of this webinar, as well as a year and a half long collaboration NCSL has had with them on our work regarding children's mental health and children's behavioral health. In 2019, with support from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the Bainham Family Foundation, a panel of mental health professionals formed a partnership to provide state and local leaders guidance on developing a system of strengthening school mental health support. Informed by national quality indicators, the guidance document, Advancing Comprehensive School Mental Health System Guidance from the Field, creates a framework with eight core features for creating a system of services to address the challenges of mental and behavioral health disorders among children. To align with our members, we on the NCSL Health Program have been working on a similar document to be released this fall, enhancing school capacity to support children's mental health. This document will highlight eight core features from Bainham's guidance document and provide state and legislative examples and policy options to enhance children's mental health capacities across all communities. Now, let's get back to why we're here today. Regardless of geography, age, gender, ethnic, or racial background, an estimated 13.7 million children have been diagnosed with anxiety, depression, or a behavioral health disorder. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, behavioral health disorders can prevent children from developing coping and resiliency skills, abilities they need to help them learn, behave, or handle their emotions. These skills are essential to healthy social development and help ensure children have a positive quality of life now and into adulthood. This webinar will highlight state policy options and trends. It will draw the connection between systems of health and education to provide an overview of core components to a comprehensive school mental health system and provide two states the opportunity to share with us actions related to school mental health and school mental health services over the last few years. We are aware these statistics and prevalency of these health challenges may change or be exacerbated by the current COVID-19 pandemic. While this isn't a direct focus of this webinar, I would like to invite speakers to highlight anything they believe is important related to this topic, as well as audience questions. Joining us today is Noah Cruz, Research Analyst with NCSL's 
Health Program, and Dr. Sharon Hoover, co-director of the National Centers for School Mental Health and contributor to the guidance document, Advancing Comprehensive School Mental Health Systems, Guidance from the Field. We are also lucky to have with us Representative Steve Ellison from Utah and Representative Patricia Cornell from New Hampshire, who will share their legislative examples from their state. Before we pass it over to Noah, we would love to launch a quick survey question. Shannon, if you wouldn't mind sending that to the audience at this time. These questions are anonymous. Really, our goal here is to gauge the level of understanding and engagement with this topic that you all have. The first question that you should see appear is, are you hearing from your constituents, experts in your state, or colleagues about the impact of anxiety, depression, or behavioral health disorders among youth? Please answer yes or no. And Shannon, I apologize, I don't seem to be, there we are, sorry everyone, couldn't quite get the results. So it looks like here um, about 90% are saying yes, they have been hearing from folks in their state experts and colleagues around this topic. Wonderful. And then we've got one more question as well. Shannon, if you wouldn't mind sending the second question now, it will be, how would you rate your understanding of school mental health broadly? You have the option to answer poor, fair, adequate, good, or excellent. And that looks like a few results are starting to come in. Wonderful, we have quite a range. So I would say that um, kind of in the thirds here, it looks like poor, adequate, and good. So hopefully this discussion here with our experts will really be able to facilitate a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for participating in those poll questions. Without further ado, I would like to go ahead and pass it to my colleague, Noah Cruz, who is going to discuss legislative trends and policy options related to school mental health. Noah, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Thanks, Tammy Joe. NCSL, in partnership with uh, Bainham, has been tracking legislation related to school and children's mental health since, since the start of 2020. To this point, we have tracked 73 bills across 28 states. Through our tracking, oh wait, <laughs> through our tracking, we have seen some common themes and trends emerge across multiple states, including increasing investment, increased investment in training existing staff, administrators, and caretakers across schools and school districts, developing new programs and frameworks that can act as models for schools, developing new ways of assessing the need for school mental health resources, including establishing task forces and work groups. And of course, in the time of COVID, we have seen many bills appropriating CARES Act and other relief funds to support students with mental and behavioral health needs who receive care in school-based settings. The following state examples have all been enacted by the respective legislatures in the 2019 or 2020 legislative sessions. Virginia Bill 619 required each school board to adopt and implement policies that require teachers and other relevant school personnel, as defined by the school board, to, to complete a mental health awareness training or similar program at least once. The bill also requires the school board to provide such training via contract with the State Department of Behavioral Health and Social Services or another certified trainer. SB 476 in North Carolina requires the State Board of Education to adopt a school-based mental health policy for personnel who work with students in grades K through 12 that, continue, that contains minimum requirements for school-based mental health plans, as well as a model mental health training program and suicide risk referral protocol. The Model Mental Health Training Program must address the topics of youth mental health, substance abuse, sex trafficking prevention, and teenage dating violence. The Model Suicide Risk Referral Protocol must include guidelines on identifying students at risk of suicide and procedures and referral sources that address the actions that should be taken. 
Maryland's HB 277 requires the State Department of Education, in consultation with both the Departments of Health and Human Services, develop and distribute guidelines on a trauma-informed, on a trauma-informed approach to assist schools with understanding and responding to individuals with symptoms of chronic interpersonal trauma or traumatic stress. A trauma-informed approach, according to this bill, acknowledges the widespread impact of trauma and utilizes said knowledge to better understand paths to recovery, identify symptoms of trauma, and actively resist re-traumatization. The guidelines are to be subsequently distributed to local school systems and published to the department's website. HB 1053 in Colorado directs the State Department of Human Services to implement and operate a statewide early childhood mental health consultation program to support mental health care in early childhood settings. The program must be designed to increase the number of qualified early childhood mental health consultants and include a model with standards and guidelines developed from evidence-based programs, as well as a professional development plan for participating consultants. HB 906 in Texas establishes the Collaborative Task Force on Public School Mental Health Services to study and evaluate mental health services that are funded by the state and provided at, a school, district, at school districts or open enrollment charter schools, training provided to an educator employed by a school or district to provide mental health services, and the impact of those services. Adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, have also been a growing area of concern related to children's mental health, and legislative trends reflect that as well. For example, Washington Senate Bill 6191 makes changes to the State Healthy Youth Survey, which is a voluntary and anonymous survey uh, administered every two years to students in 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grades to include questions related to ACEs so that their prevalence throughout the state can be better assessed and addressed. Additionally, West Virginia's HB 4773 creates a work group whose members include the state superintendent of schools to conduct a study of ACEs and their impact on the people of West Virginia. The work group will develop recommended protocols, education, and training requirements related to identifying and treating ACEs and associated health conditions. Many states have also enacted legislation to appropriate COVID-19 relief funds to support mental and behavioral health services during the pandemic. Colorado HB 1411 appropriates over $3 million of the $70 million in CARES Act relief funds the legislator had discretion over to the, to the Department of Human, uh, Human Services for school-based services provided to children by clinicians and prevention specialists. HB 1105 in North Carolina citing new mental and physical health stresses as a result of the pandemic, allocates $300,000 to the State Department of Social Services to establish a student health collaborative pilot program. The pilot program would see local education agency and county department of social services cooperate to assist students with their mental and physical well-being in a public school setting in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, Minnesota's F SF1 extends emergency waivers that allow for the continued use of telemedicine alternatives for school-linked mental health services and school district mental health services for the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I hope you found this uh, overview useful and um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Tammy Joe if you have any additional uh, comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noah, for that excellent legislative overview. NCSL also has several employees who work in our DC office and help to cover federal items. During the 116th session of Congress, we know there have been approximately 605 active pieces of mental and behavioral health legislation. Topics range from mental health access improvement to a national suicide hotline designation and behavioral intervention guidelines. As well, on October 5th, the administration signed an executive order to increase support for mental and behavioral health needs. The order establishes a coronavirus mental health working group across, across several federal agencies and requires them to consult with the Office of Management and Budget on existing grant programs helping states to enhance mental health and suicide prevention services. Next up, we have Dr. Sharon Hoover. Dr. Hoover, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tammy Joe, and really appreciate the invitation to be here today. 
So in the 15 minutes or so that I have to share, I'll, I'll be giving a bit of a comprehensive school mental health system 101, so an overview of these systems, and then hoping to dive into a few state strategies to achieve uh, school mental health success. So again, I am coming to you from the National Center for School Mental Health, which is located at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, where I serve as a professor for child and adolescent psychiatry. We've actually been around for quite some time now. We've been funded since 1995 out of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration. And you can find out a bit more about what we do at schoolmentalhealth.org, where you'll, you'll also find a number of resources for educators and uh, behavioral health systems system leaders and providers, as well as families and students. We have a number of resources specific to school mental health during COVID-19. And so it's been a repository of resources that I know many who are sitting at the intersection of education and mental health have access during this complex time. I also wanna highlight that we do have our annual national school mental health conference happening next week. It is virtual and it is at no cost this year. Uh, we have well over 5,000 folks registered so far and have an exciting agenda on uh, the topic of equitable and effective school mental health. So it may be a good place to hear what's happening across the nation. And there will also be a, a repository of pre-recorded sessions, about 250 sessions. So I'm sure you uh, will find it a good place to find out what's happening, not only in your own state, but also across the country. So just quickly want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what we mean when we say comprehensive school mental health systems. So we're talking about a full array of supports and services that promote positive school climate, social emotional learning, mental health and well-being, while simultaneously working to reduce the prevalence and severity of mental illness. So sometimes when folks think of school mental health, they're thinking either just universal supports or just treatment in schools, and we're really thinking about the full continuum. We want to emphasize that the system is built on a strong foundation of district and school professionals. So while community partnerships absolutely are part of the equation of school mental health systems, first and foremost, we have to ensure that we have adequate staffing of our educators and administrators who are part of that frontline support, but also our specialized instructional support personnel, for example, our school psychologists, school social workers, school counselors, school nurses, and other school health professionals. And these systems also assess and address social and environmental factors that impact health and mental health, as Noah alluded to just a moment ago in terms of the increased focus on adverse child experiences. So I do recognize that some of you may already have well-established school mental health systems in your settings. Others may have less infrastructure. If you are seeking an overview of school mental health systems, the resource that was mentioned earlier, the guidance document may be of use to you. We worked as a team with several of our federal, national, state, and local partners to develop the document that really goes into the why and the how of comprehensive school mental health with a number of local and state examples of how to do this work. I'll highlight a couple of the figures that you'll find in here uh, in the guidance document. First, we review the core features of comprehensive school mental health systems, and that includes things like how to establish a well-trained uh, specialized instructional support staff, as well as how to effectively team with your community partners, including behavioral health providers in the community how to establish and sustain a multi-tiered system of support, and how to conduct the full array of supports and services all the way from mental health screening and progress monitoring to multi-tiered uh, evidence-based practices, how to collect, use, and share data, and then finally, how to fund these systems using graded and blended funding models. We do emphasize throughout the document and give examples of multi-tiered systems of support. And this is one illustration of this. Most schools talk about a three-tiered system of support, although we've seen four and five-tiered system models as well. And just wanna emphasize that they are all on the foundation of family school community partnerships and also professional development and support for a healthy school workforce. Uh, we are often asked, how do schools and communities come together to provide mental health supports to students? There's not a one-size-fits-all model, but this figure illustrates the idea that very often 
school personnel, including educators and our school psychologists, social workers, school nurses, et cetera, are often most responsible for the universal or tier one supports with our community mental health providers, for example, coming in and providing more of the tier three supports like mental health treatment in the school building with some shared responsibility for tier two. But this really can look different in each school, in each community. So uh, we just want to give a quick um, look at what are some of the universal school mental health strategies that are widely adopted and have empirical support. Uh, and I'd argue that these really should be in every community's plan for creating a healthy and safe school. So first, the promotion of supportive positive school climates. We've seen a huge, uh, we've seen an abundance of resources on how to assess and improve school climate over the last two years. Uh, we also have seen an uptick in attention to culturally responsive, trauma responsive school policies and practices with a lot of discussion around how to take a look at our discipline practices and ensure that they are both culturally uh, and trauma responsive. We've seen an increase in attention to staff wellness. Um, so, uh, and especially during this time of COVID, we've seen a lot more school districts speaking to the importance of educator well-being and trying to identify strategies that can support educator well-being. We've seen more interest in mental health literacy for school staff and students. And Noah uh, highlighted a couple of states that have uh, required this mental health literacy as part of the curriculum for students now. Certainly many states are adopting standards for social emotional learning. And finally, crisis preparedness is something that many schools have adopted and even more so now in the context of COVID-19 are inquiring about. A couple of points we wanna make uh, in this area of universal mental health support. First, as I mentioned, there's been increased attention to teacher well-being, but we are encouraging our districts and schools to think beyond just self-care strategies and to really consider organizational strategies to support educators, like providing mental health supports for educators, providing classroom respite as needed, as well as other planning time. Uh, and decision-making supports for educators. This is a quote that uh, we've heard from educators. Please don't tell me to just do more yoga. And we certainly are a fan of self-care strategies that wanna ensure that they are coupled with organizational strategies. Mental health literacy, as I mentioned, has been mandated now by a number of states. Um, I think Noah alluded to or, or described the um, the work in Virginia that's been happening. We know New York has similarly required this now as part of student curricula. Um, this is one example of a curriculum that has been implemented initially in Canada and now in a number of states. It's the Mental Health and High School Curriculum Guide. It's available freely, downloadable. Uh, we know it's now being implemented in South Carolina and Maryland also uh, in some schools. And the idea behind mental health literacy is really providing teachers with the skills that they can have to then teach students about how to obtain and maintain good mental health, identify mental health disorders and their treatments, decrease stigma and enhance help seeking. We want to make you aware of a resource that will help in this endeavor toward mental health literacy. Uh, the SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration funded Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network, MHTTC Network, uh, is about to launch a uh, training for educators about mental health called Classroom Wise, Wellbeing Information and Strategies for Educators. It'll be about a three and a half hour free online training for educators to help them not only promote the mental health and well-being of students, but also to help them understand and support students experiencing adversity and distress. And there will be a module on cultural responsiveness and equity that is coupling with that. We also do want to make you aware that there are a number of readily available materials for crisis preparedness for school. Psychological first aid, listen, protect, connect, model, and teach is one of those that is widely adopted and available freely online. You can find out more at Trauma Aware Schools, which is one of our SAMHSA funded National Child Traumatic Stress Network sites. Let's move now for a moment up, upstream uh, to think about early intervention. So what you're seeing here is a child who's uh, receiving a, a well child check in a school-based health center. And we know that more and more young people are receiving primary care in the context of schools. We know this is in part because they are not accessing community health services in the same way we might wish. 
Looks like the slides just got bumped for a moment. So let me go back to that. There we go. Oh, it keeps uh, bouncing. I think maybe somebody is, is moving the slides. So I'm going to go back to my slide. There we go. Um, so well-being checkups in schools is something that a number of districts are now adopting. So in addition to health checkups, we're seeing more schools doing what some are terming mental health screening, but some are conceptualizing more broadly as well-being checkups. We have actually seen a large uptick in this in the context of COVID where schools are recognizing their responsibility of identifying students who may be struggling with increased loss and disruption in their activities. So uh, daily check-ins we're seeing become more commonplace in uh, the classroom setting, even in the virtual classroom setting with educators doing daily check-ins uh, through distance learning technology. This is one example through closedgap.org uh, where it's a free system that educators can use to essentially take the pulse of their classroom in terms of their well-being and see if they need any extra support. Moving up our public health triangle in terms of thinking about how schools can support student mental health, we know that young people are far more likely to access and complete treatment when it is offered in a school building. The data you're seeing here in this small graph just demonstrates that especially post-crisis, this is data from, um, from post-Hurricanes Katrina and Rita in New Orleans a few years back, and we found that uh, young people were six times more likely to complete mental health treatment in schools and in community settings during that. And this is consistent with other data that we've seen. We also know that there are many treatments that can be feasibly provided in the school setting, uh, as well as psychiatric care. We're seeing more psychiatric care now offered in the school setting. Uh, this is one example of an intervention designed for schools that has now uh, become more commonplace in schools cognitive behavioral intervention uh, for trauma in schools. And finally, in terms of our um, interventions in schools, I just want to take a moment to, to mention the role of schools in children's behavioral health crises. We anticipate a surge in behavioral health challenges in the context of COVID. And I recently spoke with state leaders about our evolving behavioral health crisis system. Some best practice guidance just came out from SAMHSA. And we really want to emphasize that schools um, can and should be a part of the school, excuse me, of the crisis response system. I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Uh, this is an actual photograph of a young person named Lydia, 18 years old. She spent a week in the emergency room uh, in California. Her family called 911 after Lydia began banging her head on the shower door at her family's home saying she wanted to die. And what we know is that, unfortunately, when young people have emergency departments as their first point of contact during uh, a crisis, they are very often housed there uh, for several days. They may then have brief inpatient stays, and there's a high readmission rate to emergency departments. And very often, we, we see what are deemed inappropriate referrals from schools uh, as a first referral point. We also know that law enforcement is often involved in child mental health crises. This is a nine-year-old student uh, with autism from Indiana who did lash out at his teacher after being bullied in the class, was then arrested and handcuffed and forcibly removed from the school. And these incidents are really not uncommon. We know, as you can see here, that a person with a mental health condition is six times more likely to get arrested and 16 times more likely to get injured or die during police encounters. We also know that the majority of our young people in the juvenile justice system do have a diagnosable mental health disorder. And over half of children with an emotional disturbance will be arrested at least once within four years after leaving high school. And so we know that law enforcement and emergency departments, while they may be an essential part of our systems of care for young people, uh, may be overly relied upon in children's mental health crises. And we really would argue that a paradigm shift must include a movement upstream to have schools and primary care as part of the crisis response system. Uh, we encourage you to look at the child and adolescent considerations for SAMHSA's best practice toolkit. There are a number of examples of the crisis system being uh, offered in schools. This is um, a, a 
multi-pronged approach to crisis prevention and response in schools that was just established as a promising program by the National Institutes of Justice. I won't go into details here, but want to say that it is a multi-pronged approach that includes both prevention and response in the school setting. And what they found were that there were far fewer suspensions and office referrals and more reliance on on-site crisis response, which can prevent our young people from going to more costly and less effective um, systems, whether it's juvenile justice or our emergency system, emergency department system. So how do states do this? How do states and districts do this? Just quickly want to mention a few resources and ways that states are going about advancing school mental health in partnership with the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network. There is a freely available national curriculum that a number of states and districts are now using uh, to advance school mental health. You can find it here. This, these are the core components of it. We also, in partnership uh, with the School-Based Health Alliance and funded by HRSA, have been delivering the National Quality Initiative. The states that you see here are part of the first two cohorts of this initiative. They are implementing what's called a COIN. What is a COIN, you ask? Uh, it, it essentially is a learning collaborative model that brings together multidisciplinary teams at federal, state, local, public, and private leaders in partnership with recognized subject matter experts to address a specific and complex challenge. So all of these states successfully applied and were awarded the chance to participate with each other. This is the mission that they have all agreed to work on collectively. In the, in the interest of improving comprehensive school mental health systems. They engage monthly in data collection and in virtual learning sessions along with all of the other states. Uh, and they utilize a cost-free data system. In the case of school mental health, they're all using the SHAPE system, which is freely available to any individual school district and state uh, as part of the, the coin, but to anybody. Uh, so all of you, if you haven't checked out SHAPE, can go on and check it out. A number of state leaders are using this as a way to assess and improve school mental health in their setting. Uh, a number of achievements have been reported by participating states. I won't go into much detail here, but these are some of the state's uh, accomplishments in our last coin cohort. And then just quickly want to touch on a couple of a few policy options, though I know that my time is um, is about done now. So I, I'll just touch on a couple of these. So there's some universal mental health promotion policy options that include requiring mental health and well-being as a core metric of school performance, establishing mental health as a state required component of K through 12 curriculum, better leveraging Title I and Title IV funding. Some policy options for early identification, intervention, and treatment in schools. Certainly expanding federal workforce development would be helpful in this regard. Maximizing Medicaid, CHIP, and private and reimbursement for school mental health services. And expanding reimbursement in TA for telemental health services in schools is absolutely critical. And finally, we know that policy um, considerations have to also attend to the coordination aspect of school mental health in terms of school community partnerships. For example, providing support for sharing of data across child serving systems, uh, as I mentioned here in the last bullet point. So happy to discuss any of these in a little more depth in the Q&A or feel free to connect with us at our National Center for School Mental Health. And now I will pass it back on and really looking forward to hearing from our partners in Utah and New Hampshire, both, of, uh, both states that I've worked with closely over the years. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, oh. Nope. Sorry. Thank you, Representative Ellison. I will let you just go ahead and take the floor. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I'm Representative Steve Ellison from Utah, and um, this has been a <clears throat> a policy area that's been uh, a passion of mine for a number of years. When I first got elected, we lost uh, three students to suicide in my son's middle school, and um, <clears throat> several years later, I had uh, one of my own children hospitalized. So it's uh, um, so something I'm very passionate about. Um, just like to run through some of the things we've done. Um, this chart shows uh, the suicide rates in the U.S. and Utah, ages 10 through 17. Uh, we know that particularly since the uh, turn of the century, that the rates have been increasing and uh, throughout the Rocky Mountain West, they've been increasing even faster than the rest of the nation. So we know this is a significant issue. 
Um, <clears throat> let me just talk about some of the key things that we have done in Utah. The, the, one of the bills I ran uh, created um, suicide prevention programs. I realized we didn't have one person in charge of suicide prevention in our state. So this bill created <clears throat> a position within our uh, Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, over kind of the statewide efforts, and then uh, another position in our <clears throat> State Office of Education. These individuals have been instrumental in securing millions of dollars of grants and have paid for themselves time and time again and <clears throat> have helped us uh, make progress in this area. I think uh, one thing to note is I was just looking at the data from our medical examiner uh, yesterday and uh, year over year our youth suicide rate is down. Our overall female suicide rate has fallen for each of the past five years and we're down 25% from where we were uh, five years ago. <clears throat> so we feel like some of the things that we're, we're doing is working. Um, the next slide, uh, Parent Seminar on Youth Protection. W when these children passed away in my son's middle school, I went and met with the principal. And I said, you know, I have had a boy in my scout troop ask me, you know, why isn't anybody talking about these children that have died? And <clears throat> so I asked her, what are you, you know, thinking about doing about this? And she says, well, we're going to do this parent seminar. The auditorium was packed. They had experts on mental health, bullying, Internet safety uh, present <clears throat> to teach the parents how they can be, the, you know, the, the first and foremost resource in their, their children's lives. I learned a lot, and I thought this is such a good idea. We should roll it out statewide. Well, <clears throat> the first year I rolled it out, it, it, it didn't pass because it was viewed as a, <clears throat> a mandate uh, for our schools. Well, I changed the language next year and I said, uh, this is required. However, any school district can opt out if they don't believe these are issues in their, their district. The school board just needs to uh, sign a letter to our State Office of Education. Fast forward, I don't know, six, seven years, no district has opted out. Um, <clears throat> these have been tremendously successful and we've had um, as we've trained parents on, you know, principles of QPR, mental health first aid, we've had a number of children hospitalized after the parents uh, had basic skills on how to ask their children um, about these, uh, you know, difficult topics. Um, <clears throat> the next bill, um, programs for uh, youth pr protection, um, we... Um, gave funding for every school to have a suicide prevention program of their choice and gave them funding to do that. We since uh, come in and supplemented these. Uh, one of those, the, the program that's been adopted most heavily in our state is uh, Hope Squads, uh, Hope for Utah. It's a, <clears throat> an inter international program. It's, it's in a number of states, but <clears throat> they train uh, students on the basics of QPR, question, persuade, refer, and uh, the, they kind of survey the students and find out uh, who students are willing to talk to about challenges, and then they encourage them to talk to those students if they are feeling down, um, suicidal, and then those students uh, know the basics of what to say, and then they get them to the school counselor. Um, this has been a tremendous program. The first district it was in, uh, piloted in, they <clears throat> were having one to two suicides a year. They went nine years after this program started without a student dying by suicide. Um, but we each let we each let each district decide. Uh, the next bill, HB 23. <laughs> um, after we started doing this, um, our state office of education informed us, sent out a letter to all superintendents that it was uh, against uh, the law to ask children about suicide. So we had to. Uh, clarify that um, it's uh, not not a violation of uh, any law to ask a student uh, that question. Uh, SB uh, 232 is one of the most important bills we've ran. It created, um, kind of like Colorado had the Safe to Tell program, it started a way for students to send anonymous tips. However, we tried something different in Utah. <clears throat> in addition to the anonymous tips, we allowed students to talk with a licensed clinical social worker 24-7, 365, anonymous, no charge. Um, 
via via phone or via text uh, built within the app. And <clears throat> we've had probably hundreds of thousands of students use this now. And during the pandemic, the utilization has skyrocketed as students have not had access to school, uh, school counselors. Uh, that, that commission rolled into, or that first bill created the School Safety and Crisis Line Commission that governs this program. Uh, the app Safe UT allows students to report tips, speak with a crisis worker, um, <clears throat> or you know, follow up on other uh, previous conversations. And this has been a game changer in Utah in terms of crisis intervention. We think this is one of the key components of the, some of the reductions we've seen in our youth suicide rate. Um, I know I'm almost out of time, so I'll hurry up here. Uh, HB 46, educator licensing modifications. Uh, this requires uh, all uh, licensed em school employees to take a program in youth suicide prevention training every three years. Uh, I think a very fundamental building block. HB 264 uh, provided uh, two and a quarter million dollars for elementary school counselors. Um, very, very important. Um, SB 106 uh, tried to leverage uh, Medicaid programs to be uh, built for school mental health services, a topic touched on earlier. Uh, HB 120, uh, student and school safety assessment. This uh, required uh, threat assessment teams to be placed in schools to look out for some of those students who uh, were having issues. It's interesting to note that Dr. Peter Langman, the world's foremost expert on school shooters. <clears throat> when I asked him uh, during one of his presentations what percentage of school shooters had a mental illness, he paused and looked at me and said, all of them. He says, why else would they do that? So identifying those students at risk is uh, has a dual benefit. Um, almost done here. HB 373 was one of our most important bills. We realized how what a dearth of services students had in terms of counselors, psychologists, social workers, um, and or nurses. And so this bill uh, provided funding for every school to have an additional um, FTE, an additional employee, and let them choose where, uh, what category <clears throat> they would want to hire that person in. And uh, the, the photo on that slide just happens to be some of the nurses hired by the program with uh, and with the pandemic, they obviously are serving uh, a, a much uh, a huge need in our schools. Uh, HB 323, school mental health amendments. Uh, this bill um, put in process the framework for all schools to administer mental health evaluations to students. Uh, some districts were doing this um, kind of sporadically. There was controversy about whether they had the authority to do this. Clearly sets out they can do this. It has to be with written parental opt-in consent, which that's really critical. And then we have our state office of education pro uh, provide a list of the the best uh, the evidence-based screening programs that are out there that the schools can select from. The goal is, is that when a student screens uh, positive for a mental health issue, for the school to work closely with the parents to provide them with resources either within the school or the community where if they so choose they can get their their child additional help. I think going forward that this is going to be one of the biggest game changers. I had a state school board member <clears throat> up at the Capitol fighting this bill and I pulled her aside and I said I assume you also want to cancel vision and hearing screenings that we've done to students you know an issue above their neck for years I said, or is it just that you have a stigma against mental illness? And uh, put it that way, uh, she she really didn't know what to say. I, in Utah, uh, suicide is the leading cause of death for ages 10 to 24. And it's kind of ironic that for, for decades, we've screened for vision and hearing problems, but haven't thought about screening for uh, mental illness, which is most, as we all know, most likely to manifest itself in the early, early years. So... I may have gone over my time. If so, I apologize. That concludes my presentation. No, thank you so much, Representative Ellison. That was an excellent presentation, and it's clear that you all have been very busy in Utah. 
Um, we know that you also have a very busy schedule, so we really appreciate you taking the time to put this slide deck together for all of us um, and present this information. Again, I'll just remind the audience, if you have any questions at any time for our speakers, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we will get to them here shortly. Um, up next, we were hoping to have Representative Cornell from New Hampshire. Unfortunately, due to a last minute conflict, she was not able to join us today. So I'm going to do my best here to talk about some of the notes that she's given us and a few bills that she wanted to highlight from New Hampshire. So the first one is House Bill 31. It was passed um, in 2019 and it works to establish a commission to develop and promote mental health programs and behavioral health and wellness programs in kindergarten through 12th grade. The commission is made up of members from the legislative branch, the school administrators, and different physicians. Specifically, the members of this commission will work on a number of different items. They will examine the K-12 mental health curriculum and social and emotional learning to establish a culture of mental health in schools that adhere to safety protocols, is free of the stigmatization of mental health challenges, and reduces or prevents harm or violence. They will determine methods for providing help for students in kindergarten through grade 12 who are experiencing a mental health challenge. They assess possible threats posed by individuals or groups exhibiting warning signs or pre-incident indicators. They will review the state's anti-bullying and recommend any needed updates to these policies. They will determine ways to expand community and not-for-profit mental health services. They will develop an age-appropriate school outreach program that educates staff and students on reducing the stigma of mental illness and what to do when someone's in crisis. They will increase and promote mental health first aid to school staff, students, and families to provide the school community with resources to effectively manage mental health incidents. And they will develop a health threat assessment task force at the community level or district level that will engage with public health networks, including an intervention and reporting protocol that evaluates students quickly and effectively and provides a plan to help them appropriately return to school. We know that this commission has started meeting in the last year or so, and additional information can be found on the Manchester Department of Health webpage. And then the second bill to highlight um, began work here in 2020. It's House Bill 1558. We know in speaking with Representative Cornell, this bill has been carried over due to this year's state's focus on COVID-19. But if passed, it will encompass a children's system of care in schools the Department of Education will assist school districts in using a multi-tiered system of supports for behavioral health and wellness, much like the one I believe that Dr. Hoover spoke about just earlier. And among a few other things, this bill will modify the policy for discipline expulsion from schools, require a school safety program to contain a plan for responding to violent acts committed by students against employees, volunteers, and visitors. I am happy to take any questions for Representative Cornell as well and pass them along to her. I know that she was very excited to speak with all of us today. With that, I would like to again thank all of our speakers. I know that you have busy schedules and we really appreciate everyone coming together today. I now would like to pass it over to the audience for any questions that we might have. I know that Dr. Hoover, you had addressed one in the chat previously, but if I might put you on the spot, um, I believe the question was regarding any programs that were focused specifically on student health literacy. Would you mind expanding a bit on that? No problem. So I think the question came from Michael O'Brien, um, who I believe may be based in Virginia. And Virginia is one of the states that has done really fabulous legislative work in this area. Um, and there are other states that are either uh, working on this as we speak or who have already passed um, some efforts to make uh, mental health literacy a requirement in K through 12 curricula. So essentially the idea is that students as part of their um, school curriculum are trained in mental health. And, um, you know, oftentimes when we ask students about, did you learn about mental health in school? It might be one day in the context of, you know, one class over their entire K through 12 learning. 
And so mental health literacy essentially is helping students understand how to obtain and sustain positive mental health. So it's not just training about mental illness, it's really about how do you um, obtain mental health and well-being. And then also, if you are experiencing distress or if you identify a peer or a family member experiencing distress, how can you help uh, support that person in seeking help? And it really, one of the goals of mental health literacy is to decrease the stigma, as our representative spoke so eloquently about how important it is to decrease stigma around mental illness and around help seeking so that we can ensure people um, are identified and supported early and uh, to reduce some of the really um, horrific uh, outcomes that we've seen. So there are a number of programs that are available. I mentioned one, the guide, which is one of the more widely used uh, curricula at this point, and that's in part because it's been well studied and it's available at no cost online. Uh, so that is um, available at, I believe it's teenmentalhealth.org. I can look that link up just to confirm. Um, I know also that New York State, because of their state mandate to do this, has been developing their own curriculum. I think they've been doing some work in partnership with the Jed Foundation. So uh, they would be some good state leaders to also reach out to in that, in that area. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoover. And yes, any resources um, that you believe would be beneficial, I'm happy to also make available once we get this uh, webinar posted to our, our web page as well. Representative Elison, if you are still on the line, we have a question for you as well. He might not be. I know that the representative was busy today. That's okay. We can go ahead and um, pass that to him through email. It was just regarding the Safe UT app. We'll be happy to follow up and provide more information about that. So with that, I think, Dr. Hoover, I have another question for you here. Mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine, state budgets will be tight this next year to the impacts of COVID, due to the impact of COVID-19. Um, what are some policy levers or examples of state actions you would consider some low-hanging fruit that states could consider? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's ironic in some ways that the discussion is certainly not surprising, but ironic that the discussion has turned to cuts in mental health supports uh, in schools and in the community. Uh, not surprising given the, the tremendous burden of COVID on our financial um, infrastructure, on our, our service infrastructure, um, but surprising just in the sense, or ironic in the sense that we know that unfortunately we are very likely to see a much greater need, uh, you know, of our mental health system and burden on our mental health system. And that uh, includes and maybe even more significant in our children's mental health system. You know, when we look to past uh, pandemics even um, and uh, national or community crises, I mentioned hurricanes Katrina and Rita earlier, but other natural disasters, we can very confidently predict that we will see uh, a surge in behavioral health needs um, among our young people and families. And so one of the main things that I think um, is very reasonably argued is that the last thing that we need to be cutting right now are our mental health supports. Um, and there are a number of, you know, policy levers that we can attend to. There are increased um, uh, efforts around trauma-informed schools and ACEs. Um, so allowing for some of that in the school context is one thing we've seen a number of states do. Within our Medicaid um, plans, we have a number of options for doing screening and early identification and early intervention and working with state Medicaid partners around allowing for that in the school context uh, is one thing we've seen a number of states successfully apply. Uh, so those are those are two areas I mentioned, and I, I believe you're going to make the slides available. Um, but there are there are several others um, that we've seen states successfully applying. And and the, the one other I just want to mention is staffing for you know our national uh, professional organizations, our National Association of School Psychologists, School Social Workers of America, American School Counseling Association. They all have identified 
ratios of professionals to students. And so looking at those ratios and um, trying to ensure that our schools have those is absolutely critical at this moment in time. And then leveraging the partnerships with community behavioral health as well. And some of the, um, the you know, services that can be provided by our community partners and schools. This is Wonderful. Representative Ewison. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Representative. Thank you for, for joining. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry, technical um, difficulty. That's okay. That's the time we're living in here. Um, it looks like we do have a question from someone. Um, just if you could speak to what happens when a student uses the Safe UT app to reach out for an immediate mental health crisis. Uh, yeah, so it's answered uh, at our, our, our statewide crisis call center that also takes all of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline calls. Um, we found that students are much, much more likely to use the text dialogue built into the app, which is HIPAA compliant, than to, to just pick up the phone and call, even though they have that option. Um, the crisis worker will go back and forth with them as long as they want. Um, on the back end, that crisis worker has all the notes about their previous text conversations, advice that was given. And if they, we have the ability, even though it's anonymous and confidential, in the terms of use, we have the uh, authority to do an active rescue. So we do this on average twice a week now, where real life stories, we've had a student stand on the edge of a train track underneath the bleachers holding a weapon, and they won't tell us where they're at, but they, they're still talking. So they ping their location, dispatch EMS, and we have yet to lose a child that we've done an active uh, rescue for. So um, now a lot of the tips that come in are mental health related. As, 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 you know, a friend is thinking about suicide. Uh, they call the, uh, they involve EMS or a mobile crisis outreach team. If it's um, a, of maybe a, a lesser uh, acuity nature, you know, bullying or something of that nature, the, the tips are batched and given to the school for the items that are not time sensitive. But for anything that's time sensitive, the, uh, the crisis workers take care of those and see them through. And um, one instance, we had multiple tips come in that uh, uh, two students were planning to set off some pipe bombs. They have the phone numbers for every principal, assistant principal. They involved law enforcement. Um, the students' homes were raided, found multiple pipe bombs that had been prepared and were ready to set off. And so they they involve anything that's acute, they, they triage and handle. The lesser acuity items are sent to the school, and the school counselor can continue the discussion through the app uh, with that student on an anonymous basis if they choose. They can usually convince them to then visit with them in person once the school is in control of those uh, those those tips. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Representative. Mm -hmm. And then I know we're just at about time here, but I wanted to maybe throw one more question to Dr. Hoover. I see that you have answered it, but maybe I'll just have you highlight. Um, has there been any attention paid to segments of youth that are least likely to have access or take advantage of mental health supports, such as older youth of color? Yeah, so it's a great question, Maura, and I tried to briefly answer it in the chat box because I knew we were about out of time, but there is actually good uh, empirical data that would suggest that providing supports in schools, including both health supports, primary care supports, and mental health supports is perhaps most essential for those who are less likely to access those services in other traditional community mental health settings. And that includes older youth, um, transition age youth, or you know, our, our ages 16 to 25. Um, in the K through 12 setting, of course, that would be more our 16 to 18 year olds typically. Uh, but also youth of color are more likely to access mental health supports when they're provided in the school setting than in other uh, more traditional community mental health settings. So there is there has been attention to that, which I think was your initial question and there is good good evidence to suggest that school school mental health supports are critical for this population. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. I would like to extend a final thank you to our presenters and the Vainham Family Foundation. We greatly appreciate the expertise each of you were able to provide with us today. 
And thank you to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. As a reminder, a recording of today's webinar and the presentation slides will be made available on NCSL's website within a week.